Adaptive Reuse, Jane Jacobs, and The Power of Observation. Adaptive reuse is the process of reusing an existing building for a purpose other than which it was initially built or designed for. So adaptive reuse, in terms of architecture, is when we take something that was once something and giving it a new purpose, turning it into something else. Here are some examples. Marywood College basketball court in the 1980s. So the then Marywood College was growing and expanding, and it needed a new basketball uh, court and a large athletic facility. So this court was left abandoned. So what did we do with it? We turned it into a school of architecture. But today, it's home to 350 architecture students. And if you will notice, you can still see center court predominantly in our school. And this is where I work. This is what I, this is what I call home. The same facility had a swimming pool in the 50s. The proper term for a swimming pool, by the way, is a natatorium. And this natatorium was also outgrown. And the, the university built its own swimming pool, a new facility. So we also turned this natatorium into that same school for those design students. If you look closely, you can see Larry pointing up at me in the middle, <laughs> as I just took this photograph a couple of days ago. While we were doing research for this talk, we, my students and I, realized we were seated in the exact location of the ladies above from the 1950s in the natatorium. This is my class. These are my students. So what do we do? We just reenacted it and lined up. <clears throat> Another significant adaptive reuse project that's happening in Scranton today. This is the then Scranton Laceworks Company. And this is the clock tower. This place employed over 2,000 workers. And some say that when the plant shut down, the clock was stuck at that time. Here it is today, going through its renaissance. Today, it will be home to residents, mixed use, retail, conference, event spaces. This is an interior view of Scranton Lace Company, left abandoned. This was the loom room. This room would have been filled with strings and bobbins and looms and lots of activity and noise until it was left empty in the 80s. And here's the room today, preparing to become a conference center. So there are two examples of adaptive reuse. Jane Jacobs, who was she? And how did she fit into this conversation? Jane Jacobs was a writer. She was a journalist, and she was an urbanist. And she's one of the most important influential thinkers about cities and neighborhoods and design in a century. Jane Jacobs grew up here in Scranton. She lived on Monroe Avenue in Dunmore and attended Scranton schools. I chose this image of Jane because this is what she might be known the best for. This is an image of her at a podium in New York City, <clears throat> and under the podium, it says SOS, Save Our Square. Jane fought Robert Moses in an epic battle to save New York City's Greenwich Village from the wrecking ball. Quite literally, she stood in front of the wrecking ball to save the village, to save neighborhoods, and to save buildings. She understood the value of community, of old buildings, of sidewalks and neighborhoods, and we would argue that she learned all of those values and the underpinnings of the work here in Scranton. Jane wrote, at this time in her life, one of the most influ influential books of a generation, The Death and Life of the Great American Cities, where we as architects and designers get it as the Bible in design schools across the globe, not just locally. There's a really important book called What We See, and it talks about how Jane Jacobs looked at the world. This is where the power of observation comes into play. Observation means the way we look at our world. And there's a very important difference between looking at and looking with. When we look at something, it implies a passive sort of attitude 
we're looking at it. Like we're driving by and looking out our window like at something. Like it wasn't a shame should they do something there. It implies, it implies a bit of a judgmental, passive attitude. But when we look with something, it's a very different approach. When we look at a community, at a neighborhood, at a place with empathy, with compassion, with understanding, with curiosity, with skepticism. When we look with those lenses at a place, we're truly engaged in an active process. That's what we learned from Jane Jacobs. We learned how to look with those skills. Someone just asked me recently, is it okay to look with anger? I was like, sure. At least you're looking with it. If you're in it, maybe things could get solved. You're not looking at it. So observation isn't completely intuitive. There's very specific lenses, if you will, for which we need to look through to understand any kind of abandoned place when we approach it. There's three very specific lenses. There's the economic, the environmental, and the social. Economically, we came up on Scranton Lace. It's abandoned. What happened? We need to start to ask those questions. What happened to the lace manufacturing? Did they go overseas? Did technology take over the mills? What happened here? Economically, how did this place find itself in the position it's in? Economically, what are the potentials? What can we do now with this structure? Economically, what's the potential for the future for this place? Environmentally, kind of doesn't get much better than that. We're reusing an existing container. Now, there are some issues with abatement or other remediation that we need to do with some environmental issues, but the embodied energy that is stored in a structure can never really be replaced. A piece of wood that grew in a forest for a few hundred years, then was milled and put on a floor and stayed in that building for a couple of hundred years, it's very difficult to make a case why that's not an environmentally good thing to do. And socially. Socially, never underestimate the effects of tearing out a large section of a community in the way of progress. Socially, there's a network, there's a fabric that's knit together, and our buildings have a place in that community. And also, socially, I'd like to um, give a good uh, sort of message or some hopeful advice as an educator as a design educator today in this world, socially, this new generation gets it in a way that generations before maybe just didn't. My students love brick walls <laughs> and old wooden tables, and they love hanging on to every old artifact. I don't know if it's because in this world of being disconnected, they're connected somehow to history, but they have a love and a respect for the social understandings that go along with buildings that is inspiring to me every single day. It's just a wonderful thing to see. So when those three pieces, the economics, the environment, and the social focuses come together, you have a really well-designed, well-adaptive, reused project. And here's an example of one, recent one, that I just love. This is a project that's recently been finished here in the city of Scranton. This is an old PNC bank building. It sat abandoned in Providence Corners for quite a long time. It's a large, grand, building that held that square in Providence Corners. The PNC Bank building no longer needed it, so they gifted it to the Black Scranton Project. I can't think of a better use for this building. Today, it's home to these beautiful faces. Today, it's a community center for a nonprofit for a socially large group of our community that never really had a place to call their own. Now, the building is filled with music, and laughter, and love, and that whole um, corner is activated again. Environmentally, it was a great thing for the bank. I'm sorry, economically, it was a great thing for the bank. Environmentally, save that beautiful building. And socially, it's a win. I'd like to conclude with one more very important project. Scranton Central High School in the 1920s. This large, important high school sits at the edge of downtown Scranton. This is the building 
that we are coming to you from today, right now. This is the stage that I'm standing on in this high school. This high school is home to many significant graduates through the city of Scranton. One quite notable one, Jane Jacobs. This is her 1933 high school graduation photo. You can see the glasses are making a <laughs> strong appearance at this point. So Jane Jacobs stood on this stage and Jane Jacobs debated here. She saw what you're seeing. She learned. She observed, she grew right here in this building. Today, this building is a college, it's Lackawanna College, and it's continuing on the tradition of education in the city of Scranton. And it's a really important college because it also provides opportunities for socioeconomically challenged students to get a chance at a great education. And their envir environmental position is perfect. So I can't think of a more fitting full circle than to end this talk in the location where Jane Jacobs got her beginning. And here you are in the audience. Here you are as observers. Here you are with curiosity, with pride, with skepticism, with interest. You're here. You're observing. You're sitting in the same seats that Jane Jacobs sat in. You're sitting in the same seats because you're interested. You're watching this talk because there's an interest to you. You're actively engaged. Economically, we're still having the same conversations about the environment, inflation, and the cost of living. Economically. Environmentally, our planet is on fire. And it's melting. Socially, we're getting better, but we have a long way to go. So keep being observers, keep asking the questions you need to ask, and thank you all for being here today with me.